week on The Gadget Show, John and Jason investigate the video revolution that's changing our lives, High Definition. We find the quickest and best way to watch high-def movies at home. We test the smallest and cheapest high-def camcorders in the world. And then we see if high-def can look as good as real life. Wow. Wow. I'll tell you what we think are the top five silliest gadgets of the year. And Dallas joins battling robots in the States at the world's biggest robot games. And welcome to The Gadget Show. This week's challenge is all about high-definition. High-definition movies, high-definition TV and high-definition camcorders. It's amazing to think that a few years ago, hardly any of us had even seen a high-definition screen, and yet now, high-definition is everywhere. It's absolutely brilliant. I mean, it offers up to five times the clarity and resolution of standard-definition television, and it really makes the whole experience of watching TV that little bit more sexy. Yeah, but arming yourself with all the kit that you need to enjoy this high-def TV revolution isn't cheap. So, when it comes to buying, you need to make sure you're making the right decisions. And that's where this week's challenge comes in, because it was designed to discover the best ways to watch high-def movies, to watch high-definition television, and to record your own high-def video. Right, let's get on with it. Or rather, let's let these two get on with it, because the heavyweight high-definition title bout was a one-on-one -on -one affair between Mr Bradbury and Mr Bentley. Watching a glorious high-definition movie in your living room on a dirty great big flat-screen telly is a truly fantastic experience. But what's the best way to do it? Well, John and I have very different opinions. But at the moment, I reckon the best and quickest way of getting high-def movies into my living room is still rather traditional. By nipping out to the shops and buying a Blu-ray disc to pop into my Blu-ray player. I like the high-tech solution, the cutting-edge way of getting your movie content. For me, my high-def can only arrive before my eyes in one way. Downloading. Our challenge was to test the high-def picture and sound quality of Blu-ray against a downloaded movie, as well as seeing which was the quickest format to use. First up, I connected my Blu-ray player so I could play the 50 gigabyte Blu-ray discs. These store nearly six times more information than a normal DVD. What I need to do now is go and buy a disc. To download my high-def movie, I had this Apple TV. Using Wi-Fi, it allows you to download video content from iTunes, which you can then play back through your telly using this remote control. As I sit here, I've got hundreds of movies that I could choose to download, including a hundred in high def. After a very brisk 20-minute walk, I'd reached the shop I wanted and headed straight for the Blu-ray film section. In this store, I've got about 300 high def films to choose from compared to Jason's hundred, and they cost about 20 quid each to buy. And as well as all those lovely pictures, I also get the extra features to play with, whereas Jason only gets the movie. We'd both agreed to get the same movie, I Am Legend, as this will allow for a direct comparison of picture quality. So, having paid for my movie, half an hour into the challenge, I was heading home. Using iTunes, I'd hit my first snag. I could only buy a standard def copy of I Am Legend. To get high def, you have to rent it at a price of £4.49 for two days. But having selected it, my movie started downloading. Dead easy, and I hadn't even left my sofa, except that's not the whole story. Well, I'm loving this whole Apple TV experience, but what I don't like is the fact that I've got to wait round about four hours until I can watch my high-definition I Am Legend. This whole race was going horribly wrong for me. In fact, I think I just heard John coming through and he's going to be gloating now. I know he is. Hello! <laughs> da, da, da. It's amazing how many Blu-rays they've got in the shops these days. How far are we going? Oh, dear. 12%? I know. Have you I just know. started? No, I've actually been going for about 40 minutes. There we are. Oh, sickening. So, my traditional walk-to-the-shops method had certainly won the speed test. I've got a movie, you've got a screensaver. My movie really did take four hours to download, by which time John had finished watching his and fallen asleep. Oh, my God, it's finally downloaded! Wake up! And wake, wake up. up I did, because now we needed to compare quality. OK, here we go. We synced up the movies side by side on identical TVs and assessed them for picture and sound quality. Mm -hmm. Quick! Quick! I think the colours on my disc just look a bit more alive. Not much, though. I thought the Blu-ray had 
more depth, more atmosphere yeah. to the sound. I agree with you. There was a, yeah. a sort of choppy sound yeah. as the blades were going around that I detected here, but not on the download. Finally, we agreed that the picture and sound quality on Jason's download was really very good for a download, but the Blu-ray had the edge in both quality and convenience. Oh. So, it seems to me as though the yes. best way to watch High Def is to go out and still buy the Blu-ray disc. Absolutely. For the movie aficionado, you can watch it again and again. You've got all the extra features and the best video and the best sound. True. Absolutely. I will say, though, that I think Apple have got a really exciting platform here. All yeah. they've got to try and do is reduce yeah. that four-hour wait, which is just that little bit too long. But uh, very exciting for the future. It is, but I have to say that the winner of part one of the challenge yeah. is John. With and his Blu-ray Blu -ray. Disc. Yes, well oh. done. Well, their challenge will continue later on in the programme where we do one of the most amazing tests that we've ever done on this show to see whether high-def footage can ever be as good as real-life pictures. Time for a break now, but after that, John hits the road with Olympian Sharon Davis to put training gadgets through their paces. 31 metres that way. Hey. And if you want a cat's toilet seat or a watch that you can't read, then stick around to see my top five silliest gadgets of the year. Welcome back. Now I want to talk to you about running and getting fit and that sort of sweaty business. Last year, Nike, in conjunction with Apple, brought out the Nike Plus system. It plugs into your iPod and acts as a sort of personal trainer. We tested it on the show last year and we liked it a lot. But now there's an updated version of Nike Plus and a couple of promising competitors. As ever, the question is which one's best? To find out, I headed off to do some jogging in the company of someone who's an expert in these matters, who happens to be seriously fit. I've enlisted some expert help in the shapely form of ex-Olympic swimmer and presenter of Superstars on Five, Sharon Davis. Sharon's going to be giving the latest advances in running technology a thorough run-out. Sharon, hello. Hello, how are you? Oh, very well, thank you. Thank you Tell for agreeing to help us out. And it's good to you... see your white lily legs. Oh, yes, well, uh, yes, they are a bit. <laughs> Does that mean that you're not going to beat me on the run? Instead? Well, I mean, I'm not very experienced in matters right, running, really. First up, we've got the Nike Plus iPod Sport Kit. The kit consists of a wireless sensor, which slots into the inner sole of certain Nike trainers, and a receiver, which fits onto an iPod Nano. The sensor transmits information to your iPod, yeah. which relays voice feedback while you run. So, while listening to your music, you can hear details on your time, distance, pace, and even calories burned. Now, you've got to link the sensor in your foot right. to the... Uh, to the actual iPod, which okay. I think if you press the middle button... Press the middle button. The sensor's press activated the button. with a quick walkabout, after which your iPod will tell you to hit the road. Press the centre button to begin your workout. And the range has recently been updated with a remote wristband, the Amp Plus. You should be able to control everything from this wristband, both all your tracks, volume, and starting and ending workouts, and get information on how you're doing. Fantastic. OK, well, I think mine's being a little bit temperamental, but I think yeah. possibly we should just we go should and have a run. Let's go and see how we get on. Let, okay. I think I should be ready to go. Yes, let's go. <laughs> uh, after you. <laughs> and when you're on the road, the voice feedback lets you know how you're getting on. Current pace, 10, 20, 9 per mile. It tells you things like how, how long you've been running, what speed. So, but, um, is that useful to take that sort of information or not? I think it depends on how much of a professional runner you are, whether you're trying to train towards a marathon or something to, you know, deliberately that you need to have a pace. That would be very useful then. Once you've finished your run, you can transfer the data from your iPod onto iTunes and then onto the Nike Plus website to plan your training goals and share your stats with runners worldwide. Have you ever felt your need to be part of the, a virtual <laughs> athletic community or not? There's yeah. lots of people that love to be able to run with other people as they travel, so yes, it's a great absolutely. way to meet other athletes. So, a strong start by Nike Plus. Next, we've got a rival product from Adidas, the MyCoach, another virtual training system. In this one, the sensor actually is entirely separate, so you don't have to have a pair of Nike trainers. You I like that idea. Any trainers. I think that sounds, sounds more good. sensible. Yeah. And rather than working with an iPod, it works with a particular phone, the Samsung F110. Okay. And it also has a heart monitor, which you sort of wear around here, I guess. Where your heart is, hopefully. Yes, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the sensor, which measures your strides, will fit on most laces. And once you've strapped on the heart monitor, you need to sync both up with the phone, which should be relatively quick. Come on. I think you want to try and get it as close as possible initially. That says found. 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 Good. Surely good. 
Now, it should talk to us and tell us what we're, what we're doing. 70 minutes, 25 seconds, 126 calories. So, one small Kit Kat, mini bite size. So, after a thorough road test, what's the verdict? How do you rate that compared to the, uh, the Nike Plus? It's a little bit easier to work, less fiddly. Right, let's go and put the results on the laptop. OK, then. As with the Nike Plus, you can upload your data from the phone and share it with others on the comprehensive My Coach website. Well, I, I've actually put my profile in there so okay, I can... Um... Well, what is your goal? <laughs> what is your target? <laughs> <laughs> the Olympics in 2012. What, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the geriatric Olympics in 20... Well, I've got a long way to go, but the My Coach has proved a hit. So, how about our final contender, the Garmin Forerunner 405? No phone, no music player, but it does have most of the fitness information of the others, including the heart rate monitor, and, crucially, GPS, so you know where you are. It's all controlled by this touch-and-scroll bezel, and then you can scroll through the menu like that. Let's go out onto the road. And to test the GPS, we've set out about a kilometre from home. So it's over there. Do you think that's right? Yeah, I think we're going to have to go the long way. With the Garmin, your information is displayed on the watch. It's a nice system. I like the scrolling and everything. Yeah. I don't know how easy it's going to work as you get tired. Are we any closer or have we gone further away? 721 metres. Oh, good. 776 metres this way. Nearly there. Oh, yes, Derek, 31 metres that hey. way. I've got average beats per minute, 128, and 107 calories, and roughly a mile. And obviously I'm much less fit, because I've got 144 beats per minute on average. The GPS was pretty good. That actually pointed us in, in the it's right direction. direction. And it's updated very quickly. So on the whole, I think it's pretty good. Yeah, I think it's pretty good. As with our other two gadgets, all your training data can be lifted from the Garmin onto your computer, this time via Bluetooth, allowing you to view your stats in all their glory. Out of the three, which one would you choose yourself? Which is your favourite? I would choose the Adidas one with the telephone. I would take the telephone anyway, because yep. I just think I would for security purposes. It gave me my information that I was interested in with the heart rate and the distance, um, and I could set the pace, and, and the website was very good as well. And also it had my music on there too. Well, Mr Bentley, you certainly enjoyed yourself with the gorgeous Sharon Davis. It was a splendid day jogging around the Cotswolds. Great fun. Right then, yeah. G ratings. Yeah, well, last time we tested the original Nike Plus, it was our clear favourite. But this latest version only just scrapes three Gs for me. It didn't seem to be very dependable. Both Sharon and my armband didn't work reliably. Okay. And also, it starts to become a nuisance that the sensor only works with Nike trainers out of the box, although apparently you can get adapters. The Garmin next, John. How many Gs for that? I think it's a comfortable three Gs for the Garmin, because with the GPS and the heart monitor, it's a, just a really good, serious tool for the serious run. So, the Adidas My Coach? Um, I agree with Sharon. Four Gs for that because it's handy with the separate sensor. You can use it with any trainers. It's got the heart monitor and you don't even need to take your phone with you because you can slip your SIM card into that one. OK. So, the gadget show's favourite gadget personal trainer is the Adidas My Coach. Right now, it's time for the focus group. Each week on The Focus Group, John, Jason and I present the best new gadgets we can find in a particular category to our focus group and they tell us which one they like the best. Now this week we're looking at interesting ways of interacting with your computer and our focus group is made up of graphic designers and students... Uh, computing computing students. students. So Mr Bradbury... I'm out first. You are. <laughs> this is Optimus Maximus, a keyboard which is completely configurable. Each key is a miniature OLED, that's organic light emitting diode, screen, OK? And you can send an image to that particular screen and therefore change the button. If you look down the side, there's some really interesting keys there. What they're actually providing you with is information. We've got the free memory, the current CPU usage. If you'd like to change to uh, Photoshop, OK, Stuart's just pressed a button that says Photoshop on it, and all the keys have changed from QWERTY to some of the filters and some of the effects that you get within the Photoshop programme. So it's not just a nice, pretty thing, although I'm sure you'll agree it is a very elegant-looking piece of technology. It's also a very practical idea. There's even a Gadget Show logo, which we put on here, especially for this demonstration. Would you press that, please, Stuart? OK, and it goes straight to the Gadget Show website. So you can see whatever situation you're in, Optimus Maximus can provide a keyboard layout to aid your use of the computer. What I've got is the 3D Connection Space Navigator. Essentially, it's an alternative to a normal mouse that allows you to navigate smoothly through 3D environments. 
Ross, you're, you're trying it out here in uh, Google Earth. Where are you? Uh, Manhattan Times Square. Mm, looks good. So you can rotate from left to right, you can tilt up and down, you can move forwards and backwards, and you can zoom in and out, all with uh, different actions in this control here. It's a much more intuitive way of getting around a 3D space than uh, clicking on a keyboard or pressing some sliders on the screen. If you're an architect, you can zoom way around your buildings that you've created. I think it'd be a great investment if you use something like Google Earth a lot, or if you're always into Second Life. I think a 3D navigator would be an excellent tool to have. OK, I've got a great little gizmo here called the Z-Pen, and essentially what it does is it converts your handwritten graphics or text into digital text. Now, if I just uh, take the top off there, Tansy's going to help me here. So you've got the little receiver, I'll just switch that on, and you just clip that onto your paper, any paper, and you start writing your notes. Now, you can just see a little red light is flashing here, and that's the infrared that's copying exactly what she's writing and storing it in this one gig flash memory that the receiver has. Right, let's put that then into the computer. Right, there we go. So we've got exactly what Tansy has written there. Focus group, Gadget Show, John, Jason, Susie. This is a test for the Z pen. What we need to do now is to convert it to digital text. Click OK there, and we'll see it. There we go. And it's essentially that simple. Great thing for Z-Pen. As well as demoing our gadgets to the focus group, we let them have some time to get properly hands-on and sniff, poke, and generally manhandle the kit for themselves so they could make their minds up about what they like the best. I'd find it so handy in meetings, sketching out notes, sketching out ideas. My writing's appalling, and it identified my writing very good product. Something I would definitely invest in. I actually think it's a really good idea. I think it's a really flexible device. Then it's got that uh, blue LED on the bottom, which makes it look attractive. OK, the moment of truth is here. You can only choose one of our three devices today. So if you'd like to take home the Optimus Maximus, then please put your hands in the air right now. One, two, OK. Interesting start. <laughs> uh, next up, if you'd like to vote for John's 3D mouse, then please put a hand in the air. Oh dear. Oh dear. <laughs> oh, oh, oh that is good for hey, me. <laughs> looking good for Susie. What about Susie's Z pen? Raise them high if that's your preference. Wow. A decisive Yay. win for Susie and the Z pen. Woo! Well done. Thank you all. Right, now it's time for the top five. On The Gadget Show, as you can imagine, we get sent some fantastic technology and some incredible toys to play with. But we also get sent some, well, quite frankly, utterly ridiculous and pointless gadgets. So, I've been having a little rummage around our storeroom and I've come up with what I think are the top five most silly gadgets of the year. At number five, we have the motorised twirling ice cream cone. So, here it is then, your plastic rotating ice cream cone, press the button on the side and it goes round and round. And the idea, apparently, is that it gives you more of an even lick and less drippage. Right, let's give it a go and see what it's like. See if we can get an even lick. Uh, oh, do you know what? What's wrong with a bowl or a cone? Look, it's dripping, dripping. Oh, 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 oh. Mm. At number four, it's the utterly pointless Annoyatron. Basically, the idea is that you switch it on and it beeps. And then it will randomly beep, uh, but not very often, so it could be every eight minutes. And that's supposed to annoy your colleagues. You're supposed to discreetly hide it in the office and stick it with this magnet under the desk or something. It's got three different sound settings, but they're not really very loud. Who's going to hear that in a busy working environment? I think it's utterly utterly pointless. At number three, we have the Kerala Trance Binary LED Watch, which looks great as long as no one asks you for the time. This watch uses a binary system. Look, let me show you. So it's got two rows of LEDs. You've got to add up the hours and add up the minutes. OK, so now, for example, while we're filming this, it's 8, 9, 11, 16, 22, it's 11.23. I mean, how long did that take me to work out the time? If you've got the time to spend your time working out the time, then you might like it. However, if you're a little bit busy, like I am, then you haven't got time for this nonsense. At number two, it's the drive alert. 
Now, if you're anything like me and you drive a lot, you will probably have experienced that terrifying moment where you start nodding off while you're actually on the road. But apparently, the drive alert is the end to this problem. It just fits behind your ear here. And when you just drop down more than 45 degrees with your head, it's supposed to emit a really nice, pleasant alarm that wakes you up and stops you crashing. So here we go, we'll give it a try. So I'm falling asleep, falling asleep, falling asleep, falling, oh. Well, I've got to get my head right, all the way down to my chest before it actually sounds an alarm. And that alarm would be so loud, I think I'd swerve and probably hit the barrier. And also, the other thing is, most men that I know sleep like this. At number one, it's the litter quitter. This is a cat toilet training system. It's been designed to train your cat to use your human toilet instead of a cat litter tray. First of all, you put the red insert inside your cat loose seat, but on the floor so your cat can get used to it. Bon bon. Bon bon. Come on. On the red. As you can see, Bon Bon loves it. Once your cat has passed the first stage, it's <coughs> on to amber. But don't worry, the amber disc has only a small hole, so there shouldn't be any danger of your precious kitty falling down the loo. <laughs> OK, our cat clearly is not interested in this toilet. So after the amber one, you then go green, where the hole is much bigger, and then when you go to the toilet, you remove this. So if you're happy sharing your toilet with your cat, this is the gadget for you. Oh, sorry. I didn't realise you are in here. <laughs> <laughs> Where did you find those things? In the store cupboard. I mean, oh. can you even believe that they're going to production? This cat toilet, though, this is even funnier. Look, it comes with its own software. No. So you can actually train your cat to sit on your toilet to do its business. I don't know what's more ridiculous than that or this, which doubles, I'll have you know. Huh? I've just been experimenting. It's actually a really good ear-mounted Morse key. <laughs> <laughs> It's actually good, really good, isn't it? No. It's annoying. OK. Ridiculous. I rather like this binary one. <laughs> Time for another short break now, but after that... Can High Def TV ever be as good as looking at real life? We set up an elaborate and fascinating test to find out. And Dallas joins the world's largest battling robot games in San Francisco. Welcome back. Now it's time to return to this week's High Definition Challenge. You'll recall that in the first part of the challenge, John and I fought it out to try and find the best way to get High Definition movies. John beat my Apple TV with its digital download service using his Blu-ray disc. For the second part of the challenge, John and I were working together. For this test, we took days to set it up. It was designed to see just how good high-def pictures can be, and also to see whether a very expensive high-definition television is really that much better than a cheaper one. This is the rather expensive Pioneer Curo. According to the specialist press, it's the best high-def TV you can currently buy. Its 50-inch screen automatically changes brightness depending on the ambient light in the room, so you always get the best picture. It also prides itself on the richness of its black tones, which Pioneer reckon is the key to sharp detail. We'll be judging it against this, a 47-inch Philips HDTV, which is far cheaper. It can be yours for just under a grand. It boasts technology that supposedly makes motion even smoother than in the cinema and corrects any breakup in the digital picture signal for the ultimate clarity. The question is, which of these two TVs is best? The Pioneer is almost three times as expensive as the Philips, but does that mean it's three times better? And does either Teddy deliver a picture of such high quality? It makes you think you're looking at the real thing. To find out, we've constructed a bespoke viewing room, which is inside here. Now, we know that high-def pictures are best viewed with high-quality audio, but this is all about picture quality, so that's what we're concentrating on. To test the screens side by side, we've built this special viewing wall. You'll note we have two TVs, but three windows, and that's because behind the third window will be real life. Steen here is a professional statue. Once he's daubed on his war paint, lovely, he'll stand behind the left-hand window and perform while we film him with a state-of-the-art high-definition TV camera. This image will then be fed into the two televisions using HDMI cables. 
The challenge will be for us to look at the images in window number two in the centre and window number three on the right to see how well each of them can replicate real life. Have you ever thought about being a human statue? No. Even the way you paused before you answered was quite human statuesque. <laughs> We hung around outside while our lighting director carefully arranged the lamps for even coverage and to minimise reflections off the screens. Then the camera was adjusted to get a perfectly exposed and focused high-definition image that would be displayed on our two TVs. I am so excited about this test. I always find these tests very exciting. They're, they're amazing. In fact, you know, in a mm. way, it's great for us. But yeah. this is the sort of test you want when you're going to buy a telly, when you're about to part Absolutely. with your money. Yes. Struck a pose. Yeah, that's good. That is rock solid. <laughs> it's absolutely remarkable. Finally, our viewing room was ready. Hi, we're ready for you hi. now. Oh, you yeah. like to pop these on? Thank you, that's okay. very kind. Thank you. We were blindfolded, led inside and put in the optimum viewing position. Sofa. Oh, that's nice. Blindfolds off. What an extraordinary image. We'd already been told that Steen would be behind window number one on the left. And quite frankly, that was very obvious as soon as we sat down. The remarkable thing is how 3D reality looks. Yeah. But we had no idea which TV was behind windows two and three. Now it's a question of which of those two screens most closely looks like reality. If I was a pop video director, OK? Yes. And I had my 80s pop star in a bright orange red wig, I'm assuming it's a wig, I would want to see him or her on the third screen. Absolutely. You know, because that colour comes, comes out. It comes alive on screen yeah. three, definitely, whereas it's a bit subdued, a bit dull yeah. on screen two. But I think we ought to have a look at how movement is handled. Very good point. Sir, could you unfreeze and give us some movement? Ah. Oh, how interesting. Yeah. Instantly you see the difference between reality and virtual reality. Look at the hair on screen three, John. It's alive. It's yeah. alive, isn't yeah. it? It's almost three-dimensional as the lights plays through all the hair fibres. Screen 2 is giving a more sort of shuttered effect, isn't it? You're getting more Definitely. A stepped movement. Talking of 80s pop stars, though, those moves are very to pow. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, for me, Screen 3 is the one that's closest to reality and must be, if there's any rightness and justice in this, the most expensive screen. Screen 2 is the much cheaper screen and Screen 1 is the real thing. We were absolutely right. Screen 2 was the cheaper Philips, and Screen 3 was the expensive Pioneer. But despite being three times cheaper than the Pioneer, the Philips wasn't three times worse. The pricier TV was definitely closer to reality, but our budget model did offer a perfectly adequate high-definition image. Ah, ah. So, it seemed pretty evident the Pioneer television was better than the Philips, but by how much? Well, I mean, we're in a unique situation, aren't we? We've got the two together. I think most people would be very happy with the Philips, but, you know, I've got to say that the Pioneer is better. It's got deeper blacks, the colours are richer. I said as much in the film mm. when referring to his hair. And the movement, that was possibly the biggest difference. Uh, there was a sort of stuttering effect on the Philips that clearly wasn't there on the Pioneer. OK. But the pace of technological change with tellies is blistering, really, and I think very soon we're going to get a TV as good as the Pioneer for the price of the Philips, and perhaps in a year or two, one that's better than both of them. Right, next up, Dallas. And this week he's been off to meet some very violent robots on the west coast of America. The stunning city of San Francisco, to be precise, and I was there to visit the biggest robot event in the world. Robo Games. Now in its fifth year, this annual contest attracts hundreds and hundreds of robots competing in more than 50 different events. And it's a competition open to anyone, from enthusiastic kids to experts with PhDs. The organisers have kept this event deliberately very open. They realise that kind of most people's creations will only do one thing. But by letting everyone together, there's always that possibility of a bit of magic. Think Power Rangers when they put all their rings together. Kapow! In the robot world, San Francisco is revered for one particular reason. In the mid-90s, it was the birthplace of a phenomenon, Robot Wars. Today, the legend continues with teams from all over the world gathering to fight, except these days, the robots are even more sophisticated and, dare I say it, even more evil. <laughs> this
This is Storm 2. It's one of the most successful fighting robots ever made and is a former Robot Wars world champion. But what I hadn't expected was that it was created by an engineering team from Ipswich. So I'm in the mosh pit just outside the combat arena. It's hot, it's sweaty, it's smelly, but I found Team GB and I'm going to see how they're getting along. The main weapon, effectively, of the robot is its drive mechanism. We've got two motors under here, one on each side, which really do kick out power, and then we've got a lifting arm here in the middle. It's our secret weapon here is a self-writing mechanism. We think we're strong, we'll have to wait and see. Although the Robot Wars was the main event at Robo Games, I wanted to check out the rest of the show. Before long, I stumbled across a man walking around in what looked like some scaffolding. Hello. Hi there. What's your name? My name's Monty. Monty, hi, I'm Dallas. Hi, Dallas. What on earth is this? This is amazing. it's a robotic exoskeleton and it's designed for paralyzed people so they can walk again. Are you paralyzed? Not anymore. But I was two decades ago. And while I was in the hospital paralyzed, I designed the suit for myself. Then I had a miraculous recovery, so I didn't need it. Right. But I'd already designed the thing. How does it actually work? I mean, what's in the tank okay. here? The tank is just regular compressed air. Right. Through the tank. Okay. From there, the air goes into this trigger control. Yeah. And this disc control is for the, the right leg. I can release air. I see. And then I can power up the leg. That is fantastic. Does it give you superhuman strength? Uh, well, we're going to find out. <laughs> <laughs> Monty was due to take part in Tetsujin, the Japanese Iron Man contest. Unfortunately, Monty's only competitor had suit troubles, leaving Monty to demonstrate his superpowers alone. It might seem like comic book stuff, but Monty's dream is that eventually, this robot suit will be refined enough to help disabled people walk again. As I continued round, I was struck by how many of the events here involved fighting, there was robot kung fu, miniature robot wars, and teeny tiny robot sumo. But happily, not everyone was intent on destruction. This is my new friend, Cory, who's built this wonderful orb. Is it robot, is it art? It is robotic art. It's robo art. It's robo art. It is a semi-autonomous robot collective of orbs. It's called Orb Swarm. Inside the orbs are lead-acid batteries that can be moved left, right, backwards and forwards, acting as a counterweight to move the orbs around. The orbs can be remotely controlled, or they can be left to roll around of their own free will. After mooching about, I returned to Team GB. I carried out a quick systems check, yeah, and we good. headed off to war. Now we are ready to commence battle. <laughs> As the fights continued in the arena, Team Storm mobilized for battle, but then disaster struck. One of Storm's lithium battery packs had caught fire. The race was on to put it out before toxic fumes overwhelmed the arena. It's never done this before. Have we got another, we got another pack? We've got plenty. OK, cool. Back at base, frantic repairs began. Within half an hour, Storm was rebuilt and battle could commence. OK, guys, this is it. Come on, good luck. Thank you. Good luck. Break a leg. It would be a three-minute no-holds-death match scrap between Storm and an American bot called Sewer Snake. One, go! But after just 30 seconds, it all went wrong. Storm suffered a drive failure all down its left-hand side. It was a sitting duck for its rampant opponent, but the team clung on bravely fighting and defending as best they could. The fight lasted for the full three minutes. By the end, it was clear Storm's damage was beyond repair. It was a really good fight, wasn't it? Really fantastic. The Brits had lost. It had been a brave effort, but this year, Storm had lost his crown. Oh, they were good. Oh, they, were, they weren't good enough, though. But nearly good. They were. <laughs> but the thing that impressed me most was the orb, because it was a kind of free-roaming thing. It to exactly. It free-roams, but it's got a remote control thing, but it is a sort of semi-autonomous robot, Which if you like. Which brings me seamlessly to a little robot I've got stashed behind the chair. What is this? This it's a, is it's a, dog. a little robot called Rex 
the Hi, dog Hi, is Rex. from the guys that came up with RoboSapien, the company yeah. called Wowie. The idea here is that toys, I just put him onto his off the leash mode, they call it, so he can do his own thing. That's a great remote control. Isn't it? Well. I love this little industrial thing. thing. Yeah, it's really good. The exciting thing is when he uses his various sensors, he uses the infrared with which he can now see. Yeah. He's being attracted by the reflective nature of the camera lens, oh, yeah. and he can map himself around the room, and he's living in this room like he would live in your home, yeah. almost like a real dog. Is he going to do a doo doo on the floor? I think it's likely. Mm -hmm. But hopefully not right now. OK. Time for the final break in the show now, but after that... John and I continue with our high-definition challenge as we test the smallest and cheapest high-def camcorders you can buy. <laughs> Welcome back. Now, as previously advertised before the... Uh, adverts. Uh, this week's challenge is all about high definition. And this part of the challenge is going to be about testing HD camcorders, two of the most advanced ones you can buy right now. Yeah, HD camcorders first appeared in the UK about three years ago, and I, I think I'm right in saying that you were one of the first people to buy one. Yes, I did, and I still love it. But things have moved on a bit since then. Namely, HD camcorders have got smaller and cheaper. This is Sony's HDR TG3. It's made of titanium and it's the world's smallest high definition camera. It doesn't use discs or tapes, but instead records all of your lovely high definition footage and photos onto memory sticks. And I've got Toshiba's new Camellio HD camcorder. It's the cheapest high def camcorder on the market. And like the Sony, it records onto memory cards, but it's a fraction of the price. So it's smallest versus cheapest, and we're about to find out if that means either camera's compromised. And to do that, we're using this man, Craig Jones. He's one of the greatest stunt riders in the world. Now, our first test is start-up, our ability to uh, turn the cameras on from scratch and get them recording as quickly as possible. Now, to test it, Craig is going to jump on his bike, gun the throttle, wheelie off down the road, and it's the first one to capture him on camera that wins this part of the challenge. Three, two, one, go! Recording! Recording! Oh! My camera turned on in about 1.5 seconds and started recording instantly. It. But it took my camera a good three seconds to get going, which meant I missed most of the action. Oh, fantastic. Epic wheelie, Craig. I've got a distinct advantage with this quick like start that. feature. Well, essentially, the camera is always on. It's like a power down mode. So when I flick it out, I've not got much menu to go through. It basically is, is ready within a second or two. Whereas with press the one, button. With this one, I get a welcome screen. And then once that goes, I've got to, I can press record. The second test is the zoom test, and it's all about our camera's efficiency at zooming in on a subject. In this case, Craig, as he streaks down the track. The person who gets the most captivating, most involving close-ups of the action wins this part of the challenge. Great wheelie! I was immediately disappointed by my camcorder. It only has a three-time zoom, which didn't get me any good close-up action shots. What I'm getting is just two varieties of wide shot. Really, I'm getting a really wide, wide shot. Well, I'm getting a slightly tighter wide shot. His buddy Wing is now on the front. Now, this ah, is interesting. Great. My camcorder has a massive 10 times zoom, so although I got excellent close up shots, it meant that a lot of them were shaky. I had to zoom out to get better footage. Whoa! Whoa. <laughs> oh, that was awesome. So, after two tests, it was my smaller Sony high-def camcorder that was in the lead. On to the next test. Our third and final test is to see how the camcorders cope with fast action. Craig's going to do his stuff while we stand in the middle of it, shooting it. Filming this kind of relentless action was the perfect way to test these camcorders. If they're too difficult to use, Craig would have flown by and we'd have missed our shot. Also, it's a great way of testing the camera's quality. Fast-paced motion like this, shown in high def, can often be spoiled by the picture breaking up or blurriness. I'm covered, I'm covered <laughs> in molten <laughs> rubber. So, Suze, this is what we shot. You can see Craig doing his amazing stuff, moving <laughs> just millimetres. For yep. me and John, on the left-hand side is the Sony, right. uh, that which was I yours. was using, yeah, and on the right-hand side is John's Toshiba. OK. I can see that the Toshiba straight away is struggling with focus, and, and the, the picture seems to be quite juddery, doesn't it? It's yeah. unstable, isn't it? The Sony is absolutely astonishingly clear. 
Yeah, and it it's really holding the movement very, very well. I mean, look at this. That close-up there mm. of the burnout, you can see all the little bits of rubber. You can really clean mm. it. Yeah. Whereas on yours, John, on the tube, yeah. it's, it's slightly it's pixelated. It's pixelated, so it looks as though you do actually get what you pay for. You're often faced with that quandary, aren't you? Do I pay the extra? Yeah, is it worth it? Is it worth it? I it's think lot, it is. Yeah. yeah, so my Sony wins that part of the challenge. And on that note, have a good evening. Good See night. Ya. Bye.